Thanks. So this is some work that started life at Microsoft Research when all three of us were at MSR. Catherine McKinley has since moved to Google. I'm at Cornell. Todd Mikowix still at MSR. Here is a picture of the chip that goes to the iPhone 6S. Add a little bit about what's on this chip. There are CPUs, but they're actually a really small part of the area. That's actually two different CPUs tucked away in the corner there. Other stuff on the chip, there's uh, GPUs, maybe a little bit bigger, but there's all this other stuff I couldn't even identify from the circuit picture that I know to be on there from software. There's digital signal processing, there's special purpose codec circuits. All this stuff has its own programming model. And this is not just a thing about mobile devices, which it certainly is true in every smartphone today. It's also true in the opposite end of the spectrum of computing. These large go into data centers. For example, Microsoft has found that workloads like compression and encryption can work a lot better on FPGAs. It can be much more efficient than running on a CPU or even on a GPU to augment uh, servers with FPGAs in their project Catapult. Similarly, Google has found that it's worthwhile to manufacture custom silicon just for running deep neural networks in their servers. The reason that we have all this custom silicon is for efficiency and performance. As the efficiency of CPUs begins to stagnate, really important applications are getting their own silicon. This focus on performance and efficiency has led us to a situation with fragmented and frankly terrible programming models. We've gotten by by inventing new programming models and new languages for each new kind of silicon that we incorporate into computers. Here's what it looks like today. Most of the time, you write some software that runs on your host system, say in C++, and you run, write a bunch of other programs and load them onto each individual accelerator. These are written in different languages, and they have their own special way of communicating with the host program. You set up these communication channels, and you send values back and forth. It's this decoupled approach that I'm arguing against today. I think instead that we should be writing software that unifies the system so we can write a single unified program that addresses the different hardware components um, in a heterogeneous system. There's, of course, other work that I think is very important on raising the level of abstraction and hiding the differences between systems, for example, in domain-specific languages. I think that's very fruitful, but I also think that there's always going to be room for lower-level programming interfaces for experts that explicitly address the differences between the components in a heterogeneous system. And we shouldn't be left with a decoupled approach for that kind of scenario. There are three things I want you to take away from this talk. The first is that when we design heterogeneous programming languages, we need abstractions for two very important concepts. They are placement, where code goes in a heterogeneous system, and specialization, how you take general code and you specialize it down for the particular hardware you're running on. The second is that we can provide both of these things by extending and embracing multi-stage programming, a classic idea from programming languages. Finally, there's a particular kind of heterogeneous programming that is already widespread that is particularly bad. It's particularly verbose and brittle. The programming languages community can help. And that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to tell you about what it's like to program real-time graphics on GPUs today. This is a little preview of OpenGL. The rough idea is that you have a program running on your CPU, and you send commands to a graphics processing unit that's responsible for pushing pixels out to the display. The GPU is actually organized into an execution pipeline where there's many different stages, some of which are fixed function circuits, and some of which you get to program. I'm going to focus on two of the most important programmable stages. They're called the vertex shader and the fragment shader. Don't get distracted by the word shader. That's just graphics speak for a little kernel that runs on the GPU. In OpenGL, you write your host code in some traditional language, say C or C++ or JavaScript, and you author your, your kernels, your, uh, your shaders, in something called GLSL, a special purpose programming language, just for writing these little programs. These are pipeline stages, so their main thing is that they take information from the previous stage, do some computation, and pass information on to the next stage. But they also have specific responsibilities to produce outputs. The vertex shader has to produce the position of every vertex in 3D space for the object that we're rendering. The fragment shader interpolates between those positions of the vertices and produces a color for every pixel on the surface. Now I need to show you some code. This is a tiny little completely trivial vertex shader. And you, the first thing you'll notice is this looks like a little C program. It has its own main function. And it also has these funky in and out declarations that look like global variables. And in fact, they are. These in declarations are variables that come from the CPU. They're the parameters to the shader that come in from the previous stage in the pipeline, which is running on the CPU. Here I'm taking in the position, the original position of the uh, vertices in the geometry of the object I'm rendering, and a constant offset. And I'm just offsetting all of those to produce the final result 
which goes into this magical GL position that forms the output of the stage. There are also the variables, and those are used for communication to the next stage in the pipeline, which is the fragment shader. The way you do this is you write an out declaration in one stage and an in declaration in the other stage, and they have to match the names. That gives you a communication channel that you, by assignment and reading from the variable in the next stage. Here I'm just using that in a tiny little computation to produce this own uh, magic variable here called glfrag color that produces the color of a given pixel. So we already have two separate programs in order to make a graphics program work, but this isn't it yet. There's, of course, also code running on the CPU. I'm going to show that to you now. Here's what you need to do. You need to get the shader programs themselves. There's a couple of ways to do this. You can either embed them into strings, constant strings in your binary, or you can read them from disk using fopen. Next, you need to ask the driver to compile the code and link it together, and you need to look up the, the location of the variables, the in variables that you need to set using strings. Code, however, also at in order to actually render a frame, you need to tell the driver what program you're going to use, you need to assign values into those variables that will be read by the shaders, and finally you invoke the pipeline. Wasn't that fun? There should be a few obvious problems here. One clear one is that if we made a typo here, the compiler would be unable to check it. There's really nothing that we can say statically about this program. But differently, both C and GLSL are statically typed languages, but we can't check type errors until runtime. There's one other problem I didn't show here, which is the need for specialization. In real graphics applications, there's lots of general code for rendering different appearances, and you need to specialize it down to show the particular object. I pick up the following term, but the way this is often done in graphics programming is to write an Uber shader, which just includes all the functionality that you might need, along with instructions for specializing down to a particular appearance. How, you might ask, do you specialize down a general program? for a specific appearance, the CP processor. There are obvious pitfalls, I think, that we can all agree on with the CP processor. It may be fine for configuring the Linux kernel, but it doesn't scale well to the hundreds of thousands of appearance variants that are needed in real graphics applications. I think these problems are indicative not just of real-time graphics, but of the problems in uh, all heterogeneous programming today, that there are separate languages, that we have stringly typed communication, and that there are there's, there's an unscalable mechanism for specialization that programmers really need. And programmers suffer all of this because, because uh, in the name of performance. So the, the question this talk asks is whether we can define a unified programming model that gets rid of, that gets beyond these problems while still preserving the same level of control over performance. I want to give you a picture of what this language will look like. I'm going to get into the details in a moment, but the main thing I want you to notice is that all the different languages are gone. We're one program with delimiters that decide where code runs. We're going to use the same construct, those little angle, angle brackets, to specialize down code for when it runs on different execution units. In particular, this language I'm going to show you builds on multi-stage programming, which is a classic idea in programming languages, but I have to give you a little bit more background about the, the general idea of multi-stage languages. The original intent of multi-stage programming is code generation. In general, the idea is to add abstractions to language that let you delay execution. In our language, we want to use delayed execution as an abstraction for placing code onto a different hardware context. But in the original conception of multi-stage programming, the idea is just to delay that execution into a future time so you can write code safely. To demonstrate this, we're going to write a somewhat ridiculous JavaScript program, but I really ask you to bear with me. The idea is generating actual numbers instead of just producing the number eight here. We'd like to produce an expression that when will produce the number eight. In particular, we want a string that we can pass into a val to produce the original answer which means that when we go from pow to this gen pow function that's actually generating expressions, we're not taking two numbers, we're taking an expression as a string and a number and producing a new expression through string concatenation. And we can all agree that doing string concatenation in order to get, uh, in order to generate code is definitely the wrong way to do things. You absolutely want something like Lisp quasi-quoting or something like that. But even that doesn't give you a, a classic multi-stage programming it's to, uh, to make it uh, type safe to generate code using uh, ASTs like this. Now I'm going to demonstrate for you what that looks like in practice through 
the basic constructs of our language, which is called braid. <laughs> the idea is that you have expressions in, your, in a language and you should be able to quote them. In our language, quoting looks like angle brackets, so instead of doing this multiplication immediately, we delay that execution and produce a code value that contains the multiplication. The opposite of quoting is running. There is also an opposite with an exclamation point that takes a code value and executes it to produce the output that the code value has. The final thing that makes up classic multistage programming is an escape or splice construct, here written with angle brackets. The, the angle in the scope and find another code value to split the current context. So what we get out is a value that actually inlines the literal from the, uh, from the other program into the one we're trying to generate. The upshot of all of this is that we get to have a type system that describes what code values do. Here I'm showing you a function that takes a code value as an argument, and we know that it's not just any int. That type, angle brackets around int, means a quoted int. An integer. And the nice thing about this is that we no longer have to rely on type checking later in the program. Even if we're not actually going to execute this, we can get a guarantee, for example, if I uh, insert a type error, I'll get a type error at compile time before I even run the code that I will be generating a type safe program. And that's the upshot of multi-stage programming in its classic conception. We want to be able to get a compile time guarantee that any program we will generate will be safe. I'm going to give you just a tiny taste of the semantics that we define for, uh, for this part of the multi-stage programming language. Um, the idea is that every type has a quoted equivalent, which means code values that produce that type. Then we change the traditional semantics to instead of just using a single typing construct, we actually have a stack of typing context frames. The big gamma is now a stack of little gammas from types to variables. The way that we can write the semantics then becomes really simple. All we have to do is at quoting and escaping time, pop and push frames onto this context stack while unwrapping and wrapping. But this, this simple version of multi-stage programming has a significant drawback when we want to apply to heterogeneous code. And the problem is that the only way to communicate from one to the next stage is by splicing in literals. So here I have an actual number two, not a program that produces two, and I'd like it to appear at a later stage. And this by itself is impossible. The only way in, in classic code generation style of multi-stage multi programming to get this is to, is to quote the variable somehow lift it from an actual two into a program that produces two, which is exactly what we don't want when we're writing heterogeneous programs. There, we don't want to generate a new program with every new variable that we want to communicate to the GPU, for example. There are dedicated hardware channels for communicating values from one place to another. So the abstraction is an abstraction for those hardware channels, for direct communication between stages, and it's materialization. So instead of just plain square brackets, we now have this percent square brackets that look values from a previous stage and use an existing channel, either memory or dedicated CPU, GPU channel, to move data from one stage to the next. In fact, in our language, you don't actually have to write this funky construct very much. You can, we have syntactic sugar that lets you just refer to variables from earlier stages, and this has exactly the same semantics and uses the same hardware channels. The point of this construct, then, is that we get to avoid the cost of runtime code generation. We can compile all the stages in our program ahead of time, which is exactly what you want when you're addressing a heterogeneous system. There's lots of other constructs in our uh, programming language that are built on this core idea of ahead of time code generation for stages. I unfortunately don't have time to talk about them now. I instead want to show you specifically how we take stages and use it for instantiation for real-time graphics. And the idea is to take quotes, which previously just represented programs in the same language and add these little annotations that control the compiler backend. So in our version of Braid for, open, for, uh, for real time graphics programming, which is called Braid GL, there are two different backends. You can either produce JavaScript code to run on the host, or you can produce GLSL code to run on the GPU. This coupled with a few intrinsics that tell the system how to schedule those onto the hardware lead to a programming model that looks like this. The, the thing I want you to take away from this example is that we have one program that addresses the CPU and two different stages in the GPU. Those things labeled render vertex and decide when to execute them. The render stage runs once per frame on the CPU, and the vertex and the fragment stages are shaders that get run on the GPU. 
The nice thing about this is that you get to feel as if you're sitting in a single namespace across these different hardware contexts. So to make this shader just a tiny bit more interesting, instead of just producing a flat color for every pixel in the fragment shader, I'm actually going to try to use the normal uh, that comes from the CPU. So you can see that normal is defined on the third line at the very top. I'm just going to use the absolute value of the normal vector to color the teapot, and we get a more interesting appearance. The point is that this, the compiler is able to, using materialization, automatically generate the glue code that runs on the CPU and all those in and out communication constructs to go from the CPU through the vertex stage, the fragment shade stage, and finally use the variable there. We can also use the same constructs to do specialization. So here I'm showing an example of a parameterized shader that can get two different appearances. They have a lot in common, but this lighting model can either produce a shiny appearance or it can produce a matte appearance by emitting that specular shine that's on the top bunny there. I'm not actually showing you the shader code here, but as you can imagine, there's an if running on the GPU to make this decision, which is fine, but in general, GPUs don't really like ifs. They cause control divergence. So the more of these you have, the slower your shader is going to run. It'd be better if you happen to know at compile time, time during your program execution, running, you're going to be rendering a lot of buttons that are matte. It'd be better if we could eliminate the cost of doing that on the GPU every single time. The way to do that in Braid is to introduce a compile time stage. All your code in a quote that will then execute. So then you can splice together particular choices in your shaders to get a particular appearance and specialize away all the code that would otherwise be executing even though you don't need it. Now I'm going to show you exactly what that looks like with a code example. So here's a, a tiny fragment of the code that's running on the GPU. This is braid code that has an if that runs in the shader context. In order to move that if from the shader, from the GPU earlier in time and to the CPU, all we have to do is use a splice. So now the gray areas that I'm showing you are, um, are actually running on the CPU. So we're escaping back to the CPU, doing the if there, using a CPU side parameter to decide which of the two fragments of GLSL code to splice in. That means that we get to eliminate the other alternative and we get a speed up. To confirm that we actually do get a slightly faster shader, I'm going to show you some performance results. So what you're seeing here on the x-axis is a few different configurations of the same shader. And on the y-axis, we measured the, the time it took in milliseconds to render a single frame using that shader. Here's the original version. And if we add the if in to parameterize the shader, it gets just a tiny bit slower. We also used braid, just like I showed you before, to splice in just one of the, one of the two alternatives. And it's a tiny bit faster than the original. You may be wondering to yourself right now if fractional milliseconds really do matter. And my stance is yes, especially for these frame rate sensitive systems. The difference between a successful and an unsuccessful programming model is how much control programmers have over these last few fractional milliseconds. We've also implemented a few other case studies that I don't have time to go into detail about now. But for this particular, for this uh, lighting model, for example, we implemented a different special reduces the quality of the rendered image, but gets you a, few, a slightly more substantial speed up. We also implemented other case studies doing this, this sort of dance where we trade off the visual quality with the frame rate, and we found that we're able to, to meaningfully change the frame rate that these, uh, these applications experience. And the point here is not so much the particular numbers, but that we're able to take optimizations that you can do manually or using if defs and accomplish them using our unified framework by computations and splicing in the right, uh, the right constructs into a later stage. So we think that Braid has shown that you can get performance. You can get the, the same level of performance and control over heterogeneous systems using a simple unified language. In my view, because heterogeneous systems are already everywhere, in the future, in the not too distant future, all performance sensitive programming will be heterogeneous programming. Programmers who need to deal with GPUs, who need to use uh, DSPs, should not be forced to suffer the lowest common denominator of C APIs just to accomplish the composition of different hardware units. The programming languages community really can help here. We can give people the, the safety we think programmers should have by acknowledging that computers are no longer just CPUs. Thanks very much. The demos in today's talk were all live running in a browser. You can run the same thing in your browser by going here and reading our documentation.